All right, Ryan, super excited for this guest today. Man, I've known JP going on maybe, yeah, this is three years now, an incredible leadership coach, business consultant, uh, just a present person, and somebody who actually got me into coaching. So JP Flom, welcome to the Gridiron and Growth Podcast with myself and my co-host Ryan, my man. Man, glad to be here. Awesome, man. Uh, Three short years, that's been fun. (laughs) It has been fun. I actually just had a conversation with JP on the phone, and he was giving me some coaching advice, but the way we met was we work out at the same gym, Press Mac. I don't work out anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've abandoned my workouts. I'm joking. No, I'm just. But people the, confuse me with a professional uh, football the, player pretty the, often, but I actually am not. <laughs> yeah. But we got introduced, and they were like, you guys got to meet. You guys do similar things. I was just r- finished writing the book and was trying to speak, and JP was doing more leadership coaching, but we had this incredible conversation. I told JP all my goals and things I wanted to achieve, and he said, where's everybody else in this? Mm. And that question stopped me. Wow. And then he asked me a couple of other questions that was uncovering my values and what I was really here for, and then I started crying. Oh. And I was crying for 10 minutes because, you know, you've never been asked those questions no, on the football no one... field. They just tell you, hey, there's a play. Yeah. Run the play. Go catch the ball. Uh, JP, talk to us about how you got to leadership coaching, to helping businesses, to leading retreats. Give us the story. Yeah, gosh, it takes me back a little bit. So 20, 20 plus years having fun doing this. Um, I'm super underqualified for what I do. I mean, most people that do what I do have a PhD in industrial psychology. We call it a PhD sometimes uh, when we don't have one. But I was 29 years old. I was working in Silicon Valley in the gold rush of the late 1990s and doing fun things with a competitor to Yahoo, et cetera. And Uh, one of the friends of mine who was a CEO of a company at the time when lots of young people were being CEOs uh, said, I've got an executive coach. And I said, what's that? He said, it's this guy who's going to help me with my leadership and management and all this stuff. And I said, well, God, that's exactly what I wrote my business school essay on, uh, Mm -hmm. creating a premier leadership consulting firm that does communication and team building and management. They didn't have the word executive coaching at the time, but I said, God, you know, it's exactly what I've always wanted to do. What is that? So he sort of told me. I went back and got this certification that I've only been asked about four times in the last 23 years or something, (laughs) Uh, but a really powerful toolkit, not around how to tell someone what to do, but how to ask questions that really unlock things maybe similar to the experience you had when we first met. So that was uh, a bunch of years ago. I had my first victim who was a hairdresser (laughs) in Silicon Valley uh, in uh, Burlingame, California. You can't imagine a more challenging management situation than managing the drama of like 20 hairstylists. (laughs) I love them, but there's a lot of drama, right? And so she probably, uh, I I think it was 200 bucks a month. She probably got about $50 of value. (laughs) uh, It's kind of been up and up to the right ever since. Is the hairstylist still going? I have not checked on Rachel in a long time. Really beautiful, awesome, (laughs) fantastic leader. Um, But a lot of that is just, you know, do, you know, you kind of get called to something that you know you like. Mm -hmm. But most of us say things like, not me, not now. Because we think we got to get another degree. Everyone told me I had to go get a PhD. I can't tell you how many people told me I had to do that. I said, I've already got all this business school debt. Like, I'm just trying to get, you know, out of that. Like, the last thing I want is more school. So they say, not, not now. You know, I need to go get this degree. I need to go be married first. I need to have a bigger savings. I need to have this. Or they say, not me, because I wasn't born in this place. I didn't go to that school. I don't have that debt. I don't have that whatever. And so not me, not now is a killer of so many dreams that I see in people. But fortunately, at that time, something in me was courageous enough to say, yes, me, yes, now, and jump and do it. How do you stop people from regurgitating negative and limiting thoughts? And that's something that, you know, whether it was a teammate of mine who was, you know, struggling or, you know, family or friends or even my kids, you know, how do I... How do you stop someone when they're saying, I, it's not me, it can't be me, or I'm not ready yet? What do you do to prompt them to go beyond? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the, gosh, what, the short answer is whatever it takes. Mm. Meaning you and I, many have talked about, gosh, if I just had more modules, then I'd be ready. Yeah. If yeah, I just had this that. playbook, then I could do it, you know? Um, and I've got a lot of modules now. I've done a lot of work on myself over the last 20 plus years. And a lot of those things are relevant to other people. So I do have some things that I do, and you've seen a few of those. Mm-hmm. But mostly I have the, I just see something in you that's ready to break through. Mm. 
And how do I help you see that thing in you that's ready to say no more? Mm -hmm. I'm done being in a bad relationship. I'm done working in a job that's eroding my soul. I'm done, you know, being overweight or unhappy with my body, whatever it is. Like I'm, you get to that point. And so then I think I help people by explaining, you know, you're not special. You don't get to be special about making up just because you're from wherever, just because you don't have whatever, that it's harder for you. Mm. We all have some version of that. Yeah, even the Richard Bransons that I got to work with, even the you know CEOs that are kind of famous on our website, like those people all have some story. They tell me about why they you know why it's harder for them. Mm-hmm. And so I help them, the new person, kind of align on all those other people, and they go, ah, well, shit. I guess I don't get to keep making up this story, do I? Yeah. How do you do you tell them that in the moment? Like, hey, you're not special. I do. <laughs> You've met Devin. And how does that how does that go over? <laughs> yeah. With a Richard Branson or any of the CEOs? Because yeah. you're working with, you know, private equity. You're working with some of the biggest investors and business people in the world. Like, how does that conversation go over? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Generally, it goes over well. Uh, and I think because people know that before I'm provoking them or, you know, kind of taunting them in that way, it's always for their good. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm usually not engaged with them unless I see something special with them. Um, I've got the the privilege now of not just taking hairdresser clients, but we've got a bit of a waiting list. So I get to select people that I think are ready for a change and that we really kind of click, uh, which I think is really important, by the way, in hiring any executive coach. Mm -hmm. A lot of people find us because of our fancy backgrounds or resumes. It's really not what you should select for. You should select for chemistry, someone that you trust, that you can be vulnerable with, that thinks, you know, that really gets you. And so normally I'm in a situation where we've had that. Uh, It's usually pretty early on, though, and they just know that I do it with the right kind of uh, energy and smile and a little bit of rapport. And they know that, uh, you know, and they also just know it's true. Mm -hmm. They know that I'm not doing it to be a jerk. They know that I'm doing it to provoke them to find a next gear. Talk about how you found your next gear. Um, I would say since I've known you, I've even seen a transformation in yourself. And you're not just coaching people and then not doing the work yourself. How did you find your next gears? So many next gears and so many more to come. Um, I would say one of the biggest things that happened to me was the gift of getting a chronic illness, um, which sounds funny to say, wow. but I got uh, Lyme disease nine or 10 years ago, and that prompted a desperate search for getting fixed, getting cured, getting healed. And I thought what I had was a physical ailment, and I did. I had a bacteria ravaging my body and causing all kinds of joint and muscle pain and aches and different things like Lyme disease does, causing all kinds of um, finally um, brain fog, memory issues, cognitive decline. I had to stop being CEO of Green Peak for a couple of years. And thank God one of my partners, Neil, who's fantastic, stepped in. But I was not myself, maybe 30%, 40% of, quote, normal. And so I felt like what I had to find was a cure. And I went to 50 different doctors in the first 10 months. Mm, A couple were repeat, you know, but 25 unique doctors trying to figure out. First in Denver, then in across the country. I leveraged some of my contacts to get into the specialist at John Hopkins and the lead guy at, at Stanford Medical. And no one could quote, figure out exactly what it was, partly Lyme, partly virus, partly this, partly that. Uh, ultimately, what it led me to was figuring out, like, I needed um, I needed heart healing, hmm. not just physical healing. And I can look back on it now and go, thank God I got sick, because if I didn't, I never would have done the things that I ended up doing, yeah. some plant-based medicine things. Uh, some real soul searching, some letting go, et cetera. So that's probably the short answer of finding the biggest next gear most recently, you know, in the last few years. What do you recommend for people? You know, you mentioned you you went to a plant base, you you got in, you know, did some things to find yourself. What are things people can do if they're stuck or if they want some perspective? What are things you encourage them to do actively so that they can put themselves in a literal new surrounding? Yeah. The best new surrounding I think people can put themselves in is nature. We get so busy on our phones and so busy in our cities. And I was living you know, downtown when you met me at the Four Seasons, yep. <laughs> you know, in the middle of the, you know, all kinds of radiation of all kinds and, you know, people and bustle and hustle and that sort of thing. And I think when we, we kind of lose our ability to be still or to be quiet, and the best way I've found for people to do that is to do it in nature. Mm-hmm. So I've now signed up for, you know, minimum, I moved you know, near a park and so... Yeah. I'm out there, you know, every day for a little bit of time. Shoes off, you know, grounding, bare yeah, feet, that, the whole deal. No Wi-Fi. Yeah. No Wi-Fi. <laughs> How come we lost um, – I, mean, I feel like our culture misses that more than any other culture. Like every other yeah. culture has, 
whether it's vacations or something or getting to nature or going, you know, my, my, my aunt's Chinese, she does, uh, chi, you know, chi every morning, Tai Chi every morning. Yeah. Do you think we've lost that as a culture here in this country? I'm just smiling at you guys. You guys are two of the best looking guys with amazing <laughs> smiles. They're just making me smile. Uh, you got distracted. Appreciate that. Um, it does feel like that. You know, it feels like we've gotten caught up in bigger, better, more, faster. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of the capitalism of Western culture that is, you know, more cars, more TVs, more money, more everything, you know, has been has been kind of the big push. And I got caught up in that, you know. I think I told you about say, three or four years ago now, I, I embarked on the quest to simplify my life. And yeah. part of that was the heart healing that I got through those things. And then finally, you know, once I had a, had gotten that change in my in my energy, you know, I got physically healed very quickly after after eight years of trying everything. Um, so I think I told you, I sat a, a lake house, I sold that. I had a boat, I sold that. Sold the jet ski, I had a Ferrari, I sold that. I had a Range Rover, I sold my you know my other car. I had a couple of rental properties, I sold those. I got out of the penthouse in first and four seasons, and then that new building, the Colorado, and I downsized my life. I now have an electric moped that I zip around (laughs) to play pickleball for six bucks an hour. I've got a a puppy. Like, so I've really simplified. And part of that is, you know, nature. And part of it, I simplified my schedule. You know, I was doing everything all the time. People ask me, well, how often do you go out? You know, like, what do you mean? Like at night, like how many days a week? I was like, you know, I know you, you know, you travel a lot, you have clients and then you have your kids and you're dating and you're doing this different stuff. Like how many nights a week do you go out? Do you think? And I was like, Oh, well, all, all of them, <laughs> like, like, like all of them, like what, I, you know, always, you know, I'm right there. We pre-party at my place before, then we go post-party like all the time. And I just had a really hard time being still or being silent or just being with myself. Mm-hmm. And so that was a real learning for me, you know, nature and stillness and staying in on a Tuesday night, God forbid to read a book. <laughs> you know, I was kind of going, going, going and entertaining people and giving a lot, but also sapping a lot of my, myself. I think I had a lot of that after, probably after our conversation, because it was right before, I think we talked right before the pandemic happened, uh, maybe a couple of months before the country shut down, but I was out all the time, like playing football. Like I was always looking for the next dopamine hit. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm going out or I'm going to party or I'm going to celebrate or wait, you're doing this in LA, I'm on the way. Like, yeah. And you have to find that self in- FOMO Airlines, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's- uh, but you have to have those moments in life. And you I think I'll never forget this. You told me, you said you should be ready for two to three things to go wrong every year. Mm. And yeah. and understand that. I'll never forget that in the conversation because we always plan for everything to go right. Mm-hmm. And JP always says you need a little pr- propulsion uh, to go forward. But like, don't expect it to look Perfect. Like, yeah, you're going to come up with a business plan, the strategic plan, but like there are going to be pivots along the way. Talk about, you know, how do you do that in real time now with leaders? Yeah. Yeah. That funny thing I said to you was you just expect two to three big things to be a problem or challenge or go wrong every year. And if it's only one or two, you, you got a lucky year, yeah. right? you know, because we think so often if we solve this problem, once I fix this problem in my business, once, you know, we get over this health issue with my daughter, once we have this thing, then my life will be great. And it's actually not. You know, what we're really building is resilience. And so once we know that we get really good at handling the curveball, the challenge, the problem, and we just know that we're, you know, kind of, um, we're, you know, anti-fragile is the term people are saying these days. It resonates somewhat with me. But, you know, we know we're strong. We know we can handle, you know, anything. And so I think a lot of people also focus on problems um, and and getting really good at it. A lot of my clients are great problem solvers because they're so smart and they got so many A's in high school that they went to the fancy colleges and they did all this stuff because we got really good at solving problems. But if you solve problems and you get really good at that, what do you have at the end of the day? No problems, nothing, the absence, you know, like just kind of nothing. But if instead you look to build something, create something, which what we're really designed to do as humans, you have a, a, you know, a, a passion to build this metaphorical skyscraper, whatever that is for you, mm-hmm. this business, this relationship, this uh, that this 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 thing you want to do, you'll have a whole bunch of problems along the way, and you'll solve them just like good problem solvers do, with a lot more energy and passion because you're building something special that you're committed to. But at the end of the day, you don't just have the absence of something, you know, no problems. You have the skyscraper, mm. you have the incredible thing you're building. And so, so many people are focused on problem solving. It seems like a good trait. I'm focused on skyscraper creating, which is even better, even though you'll solve some problems along the way. So. We have to get good at problem solving. We have to be anti-fragile. But a lot of it is we have to get really good at figuring out what we want to create. 
Mm-hmm. And then next and then next. And I've got a couple places where I started coasting. And then I got bored. I created this cool thing. And then I had not hairdresser clients, but the CEO of General Motors. Well, that's pretty cool, right? That's neat. But what's next? What's next? What's next? You know, we all, we, we think we're kind of done and we're never done. Did you have any imposter syndrome when you're coaching the CEO of General Motors and you don't have the PhD? Like, do you, do you, did you have, did you run I have into- it right now. You guys are so <laughs> grand this. You're so articulate. That was my first podcast ever, you know? Yeah. I have imposter syndrome now. Uh, I think if you're doing anything cool, you have, quote, imposter syndrome regularly. Mm-hmm. If you're just sitting on the couch watching reruns of some TV show, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> you know, this is pretty easy. I'm pretty, I think I'm good at this. But if you're trying to do anything that's significant to you, it's going to, by definition, require something unknown. You know, you don't know how to do it. You're working on a book now? Uh, no. Nah. Done with a book now? Yeah, I'm done with it. Bestseller. Yeah. Benny Fowler. Is yeah. it already a bestseller? Yeah. It was, I, re- I released it uh, uh, right before we met. Oh, that that okay. Yeah, yeah, right before we met. So when you started the book, you're like, I want to write a bestseller. Yeah. But you don't know how to write a bestseller. It's so by definition, you know, what are you going to do? You feel like that, quote, imposter. I don't know if I like the word syndrome to it because it almost feels like it's this ailment that needs to be cured or whatever. That's the sign that you're probably doing something cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you feel like, I don't know what I'm doing right now, that's probably a good sign yeah. because you want to be doing it so you actually care. I want to be good at this thing, but I'm growing because I'm not already a master at it. I'm about to find the next gear. Mm-hmm. How great. And there's that fine line between fear and excitement. Yeah. But we all have that feeling of like, I hope they don't know how, <laughs> that, you know, how dumb I am. I hope they don't see that I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I hope they don't find out that I'm, quote, the imposter, right? And then they'll reject me. They won't, they won't invite me back on the podcast. They won't, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Um, but I think that's a sign. If we can reframe that to like, wow, I'm on the right track yeah. to growth. I'm on the right track to something that's going to be fun. Because now you know how to write a book. Yeah. But that's going to be easier the next time. What's the next thing that's going to be the growth, you know? We're talking about my you're coaching gonna, program and, yeah. and, and yeah. me leaning into more of myself and you challenging me. It's like you're not going to have it figured out, just but lay it out there. Yeah, you're a coach who's already this famous athlete, already has a business best-selling book, and is wondering like, oh, am I going to be a good enough coach in this or that way with these types of people? You know you already are with the people you've worked with and changed their lives, but with these next people, right? So we all have some version of that. No. I'm just getting to know you, but you know, I'm I'm hoping you're doing something fun and scary that you're feeling like you don't know what the heck you're doing. Yeah, everything yeah. he does, you're, you're in it right now. Yeah, everything. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I love that you said reframing things, because for me, making peace with fear, making peace with that uncomfort, knowing that's a constant, not a variable, really helped me. You know, yeah. because like you said, we're never we're never nervous when we're going to get our favorite ice cream, right? We know what we're gonna get. But the minute we're doing something unknown, well, that's when these ideas can come in. And, and I just learned to recognize them and kind of say, okay, I'm, I'm in a good spot. Right? I used to think before every game, even when we played together, that I was going to give up six sacks in the game <laughs> and I was going to be released. And that used to just, you know, get me real nervous and sweaty before games. And then it just all of a sudden was like, this is what, how I'm going to feel every time I step on the field. And so I kind of made peace with that. And that's kind of how you're mentioning just – Noticing it and, hey, this means I'm in a good place. This means I'm growing. Yeah. This means I'm not going to be average. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just, oh, man, average kills me. Yeah. You know, you have so many people in average jobs and average relationships and being average parents and, uh, uh it kills me. But if you're pushing yourself, you've got a chance of being excep- exceptional. I want to you know? pick up on that. Oh, I had one thing, though. Can yeah. I say it? Yeah, absolutely. You had this, this ice cream metaphor. I've never thought of this before, but I love it, which is, it's real easy to order your favorite ice cream and oh, you're real yeah. comfortable. But yeah. when you get that one that's, you know, you get the 31 flavors, all these wacky flavors. How about those little spoons? Yeah. You couldn't do it during COVID, but now you can. Again, they get those little spoons and you can try it. Yeah. Like, how about we just start living life with those little spoons? Let's try a little bit of that. Oh, you know what? That was okay. Yeah. Wasn't my favorite. Let me adjust. I yeah. loved it. Let me have more. Yeah. Right? Like, let me try a little spoonful. Let me try another little spoonful. Like, they probably sell those, you know, for two cents a piece. Like, we the metaphor of little spoons is cool. Like, I like where you're going with that. And let's not no, you're just about to use that. Yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that. What is your favorite um, ice cream? What is my favorite ice cream? I am probably a mint chocolate chip yeah, guy. Yeah. Like a good classic. But you know what? I can be as boring as to get just a straight of vanilla. Yeah. Okay. No. I, I feel you. Peppermint bonbon, milk, mint chocolate <laughs> oh, yeah. all day. Yeah. All day. Uh, milk chocolate, though, <laughs> not dark chocolate in the peppermint, you know, ice cream. That's just me. I love it. But I want to I combine 
two things from my last question. You've mentioned relationships uh, a couple of times. And one of the things that Benny and I have seen too many times are failed relationships that end up costing our teammates not only money, but, you know, peace of mind, stress, time with their kids, whatever it may be. What are some important things to think about as a high performer when it comes to relationships that, you know, romantic relationships, significant others? What are important things to think about to continue to be successful as a high performer while also growing in a relationship with your loved one. Yeah, and you're talking about maybe non-professional relationships? Yes, 100%. Yeah. yeah, so like I'm a high performer, but you know, we've seen guys, you know, one of my buddies always asks people, "Why are you getting married?" And one of my guys goes, "Well, we like the same tequila." We I'm like, "Hey, man, like that's not maybe the best. Maybe next time say you love her, right?" <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> but we can get distracted, I feel like, because we're a high performer, it's like, "Okay, this fits the relationship box, so I'm just going to deal with this." But that's not growing in a relationship. That's not finding the right person for you. What are important things to think about as a high performer to create a successful, non-professional, you know, loving relationship with your significant other? Yeah, I love it. This is timely for me because I leave Saturday to get married next Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> so you so better have an answer. <laughs> I have an answer. She does like good tequila, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. Um, First of all, I don't know who said it. It's been quoted a few times. You know, the math won't matter, but it's something directionally probably accurate, which is they say 90% of the happiness you have in life is related to the person you pick as your as your partner, mm. as your romantic partner, who might be the father of your children or, you know, might be someone you're with for, you know, 20, 40, 50 years, hopefully. And so that's a big deal, right? Yeah. But how much energy do you spend nurturing that relationship versus all the other things you do? I mean, nowhere near 90%, yeah. right? I mean, if you give it 10%, it'd be amazing. If you plan a date night once a month, you'd be a hero, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. it's amazing how little we put into that. And so we only really seem to focus on it when something's going wrong. Once you're into, you know, once you're done with that pursuit phase, wow, she's attractive, he's handsome, I, I have energy, you know, and we kind of like lean in and we think about it, we do it, and then all of a sudden, we're successful. We, clo- we, quote, have you know, gotten that great person, and now fast forward three years or 10 years, and you're married or whatever, and now you're kind of taking that for granted because you feel like that's set. You check that box. Now you got to go hunt all these other dragons and slay all these other, you know, things. And so I feel like part of it's just like a consciousness of, wow, you know, how much energy you're putting into that. When your partner comes home, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, do you – get up and give him a big hug and be like, I'm up just like the golden retriever does. Yeah. yeah. Or do you not? You know, you're kind of just waiting and take it for granted. What's for dinner? You know, that kind of thing. And you just lose that, you know, some of that, that energy. You know, I would say uh, I used to think 90% of it was selection. Let me find the right person for me. Mm-hmm. And 10% of it was, you know, let's, you know, let's take care of each other. Let's maintain, you know, let's, let's do that kind of stuff. I now think it's maybe 50-50. Both are huge. I mean, 50% of the equation is probably finding a person that's compatible with you. Similar values, wants to have kids, cares about this, doesn't want this, you know, wants to live here. Um, that's important. But I think the f- full 50% of it, half the equation, is probably like, what do you do post you're with the person? Mm-hmm. And so what are those rituals? So my fiance and I have non-date night. That sounds weird, right? We're good at date night. We love hanging out together. But we had to proactively say, let's pick two days a week and let's make them the same day. So we've got kind of a tradition and ritual about it that we have non-date night, which means go do anything you want, come home as late as you want, have fun, go make sure you're hanging out with your buddies. In my yeah. case, you know, let me let me cultivate some of those, you know, same-sex friendships that are important to me so I don't have everything riding on her. She has to fulfill all my needs. No, I've got great friends. And I'm making a concerted effort that when someone asks me when can you do something, I know, oh, I can't do it. Thursday, but hey, next Monday or Tuesday, would that work? Or the following Monday or Tuesday, would that work? I, I know I've got yeah. days available. And it creates some separation so that when we come back together, you know, we've, quote, missed each other a little bit. Yeah. And then I travel some and she does too. You know. So we have that. So I think there's, you know, traditions that you can bake in. Some are kind of unconventional, like non-date night, right, that are that are interesting. But I think a lot of it is like having, um, you know, having some rituals around, have some goals. Are you doing your goals together, you know, annually? And on a quarterly basis, are you revisiting those and, checking in on those, you know, are you asking questions like, you know, what's one thing I can do to support you today? Wow. You know, that kind of thing, like having just some simple rituals to nurture that um, and keep seeing what's special about them. And the biggest thing I'd say is just keep growing yourself. If you're stagnant, you're just going to get boring, you know? And so what are you doing to make sure that you're more interesting tomorrow, next week, next month, you know, 
You can you see why back. JP is the shit. Oh like, man, I love it. And you um, will be back. We will yes, have you back. We, we have to have him back Already? because there's <laughs> man, now I can Already, relax. Man. There's yeah. other now things. I can relax. There's other things that we want to dive into just in terms of overall leadership. Um, we see athletes in transition. We were athletes in transition, but you're working with CEOs and high performers all the time, and we definitely want to dive in that into that on the next episode when you come back from your incredible wedding. But congratulations, my friend, and thank you for joining the pod. Thank Absolutely. You. Love being here. Thanks for uh, being my first. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, JP.